Okay, uh, welcome every, back everybody for the, the final talk of uh, this weekend's conference. It's my pleasure to introduce my ex-colleague, uh, Professor Gordon Noble from the Department of Archaeology at the University of Reading. Um, what links the, uh, these last two contributions is really the benefits or seeing, seeing the benefits of really uh, substantial benefits, um, investments of resource into looking at the Picts, um, whether that's artifact led or site led as, as we're gonna hear from, from Gordon. Uh, Gordon's most recent book, I believe is this one with uh, Kenny Brophy, prehistoric Fortiviat. Um, but what Gordon's going to talk to us about is one of his two major um, funded projects. These projects are uh, the Northern Picts and one we're going to hear about today, which is comparative kingship. And on social media, you've been giving us some strong hints. There's going to be some exciting material coming out of this talk on Abilemno. So uh, over to you, Gordon. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, Sally. Thanks. Um, just uh, share my screen. Right, thank you much, Sally. And uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for hanging around to hear this last talk. Um, this is a co-presentation by myself and uh, James O'Driscoll, um, also from the University of Aberdeen, uh, who's listening in and will hopefully be able to join us in the Ritchie Arms uh, afterwards. Um, so yeah, so this uh, weekend is dedicated to Anna Ritchie. Um, well, all I can say is that uh, Anna has been a great inspiration to um, my work in picture studies and particularly uh, I really recognise and admire that uh, ability to go between different periods, between prehistory pre and the early medieval period, which is what I've done in my, my own career. Um, and just to, to extend thanks to Anna, um, myself and Nick Evans is writing a, a new general book in the picks and Anna um, has been incredibly gracious with her time reading through every single chapter um, and uh, providing fantastic comments. So thanks so much, uh, Anna, for that. Um, so this, this talk today is uh, really leading on from our comparative kingship uh, work at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, which is a Leverhulme Trust funded project. Um, and you probably know of our work in, in Northern Pickland before, but as part of um, comparative kingship, we've been looking southwards to look at other parts of the uh, Pictish kingdoms, in particular um, the Southern Pictish uh, kingdoms. Um, um, and it's really in that kind of later first millennium AD context that we see the rise of the South in terms of the southern parts of the Pictish kingdom is becoming preeminent and, and the most important part, as far as you can see, of, of what's left of the Pictish kingdoms uh, in the transition to the kingdom uh, of uh, Alba. Um, and so we've been looking at a number of different sites in, in southern Pictland, uh, but it's really Aberlemno that you know, caught our attention from quite an early stage. In fact, it was the very first site that uh, um, James uh, did some geophysical survey here um, by the roadside of uh, uh, the roadside stones at Arborlemno. Um, didn't find very much in that particular occasion, but we've been at it uh, in the years since, really trying to pin down what might be at Arborlemno um, that would uh, um, explain why so many carved stones are uh, sitting in this uh, uh, landscape. Um, and indeed, when we look at this landscape, we see this incredible richness of sculpture, both um, picture symbol stones and uh, decorated cr cross slabs with, with, with symbols, and indeed other types of sculpture as well. Um, so this is uh, a plot of the modern um, uh, parish boundary, as Anna showed uh, uh, in a 1995 paper that might have included uh, originally included uh, places like Aikenhat as part of the parish, um, but we've so far only really plotted the, the modern boundaries. And within the, the modern parish, you can see the, the number of different carved stone monuments um, focus itself on Arbor Lemno uh, and this old uh, routeway going through uh, this landscape heading up towards uh, Brecon. Um, it includes uh, uh, possible warrior carving at Westerton, um, a range of symbol stones um, along the roadside at Arborlemno and also at Flemington Farm. Um, 
two different sculptures at um, uh, Woodry and also a monument to Albar as well. So again, incredible richness of archaeology and uh, um, carved stone monuments in this landscape. Um, so this is Westerton at the southern side of the parish, um, uh, looking down towards the route down towards Dunnekin and that area to the south. Um, and you can see it's quite a degraded, uh, delaminated uh, sculpture today, but it seems to be part of this tradition um, or, you know, limited tradition uh, so far of uh, these, these warrior carvings uh, with an example from uh, Kalesi, uh, the new one from Tulloch and, and Perth, and also from Rhiney as well, these carved um, warrior figures bearing arms. Um, by our Belemna itself, we've got the um, fantastic uh, uh, serpent stone um, on the left here. Uh, the stone that was found at Flemington Farm in 1962, plied up by the farmer. Uh, and another possible symbol stone here with this uh, uh, possible crescent or maybe arch uh, on its side there, which is quite unusual. And then, of course, the, the, the particularly famous monuments, the cross slabs, uh, the roadside cross here uh, with the uh, hunt scene on the back and then by the church itself uh, with the battle scene on the back here, this fabulous um, rendition of some sort of major um, uh, military um, intervention. And then as I say, there were actually two stones recorded at Woodray, only one survives today. Um, these were found in the floor of a castle or some sort of large uh, building, a medieval building. Uh, and then this is the monument from Albar. Uh, so all very impressive um, uh, monuments with, with scenes on the, on the back of them. Um, is Aberlemno the site of Nexon Smear? It's not something I'm going to go into any detail today. Um, but suffice to say that some, some of the, our findings in this landscape might... Uh, Add ammunition to this a long uh, standing debate, or the, certainly the debate since Alex Rolf's uh, fantastic 2006 article debating whether, you know, um, Dunnekin in Angus or Dunacton in Speyside is the more li likely uh, battle site. Um, not anything we can probably resolve today, but we can certainly see that there's lots of significant remains at Arbor Lemna. Uh, the archaeological landscape uh, this is uh, a plot by James looking at all the different. Um, monuments in this landscape. Um, so as well as all the carved stone monuments, we have a series of forts, Turin Hill, uh, actually five different forts um, or enclosures on the hill at Turin. Uh, Finavon, obviously, the, um, the famous vitrified fort at Finavon. Uh, but there's also a series of low-lying enclosures, um, including at Balbini, Broomnow, uh, and a few others. Um, and then various other uh, monuments uh, standing in this landscape, um, kiss churches, um, and then you get the Roman camps just to the uh, north here along the um, river South Esk. Um, in terms of what we've done in terms of uh, surveys so far, um, well, James uh, has done a lot of LIDAR imaging, um, geophysical survey, um, and we can see that there's uh, an incredible um, landscape here, a funerary landscape, um, LIDAR survey, for example, showing up a whole series of mounds just to the east of Aberlemno and just to the south of Balbini, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, some of these map on to recorded kiss. So it looks like we've got um, a series of different, pro probably Bronze Age, but could be later as well. And certainly just to the south of Balbini, there's this intriguing crop mark of a, a square enclosure with a a round um, mound in the middle, um, perhaps one of these double um, ditched uh, Pictish monuments you find at, at some cemeteries um, like Greshop um, or uh, Pitt Gaveney up in uh, Murray. So there may well be uh, a Pictish cemetery uh, in this landscape as well. So with uh, our excavations in this landscape, we first of all started at Turin Hill. Um, being the obvious kind of major landscape feature uh, in terms of fortified sites in this landscape that uh, haven't, hasn't yet been investigated um, to any detail. 
Um, and over a period of, of a week after um, James has spent quite a bit of time doing uh, survey work here for geometry and geophysics, uh, showing uh, this bi bivalent uh, fort, a very large example up against the ridge here. And then there's three different uh, ring forts or um, dun-like uh, enclosures on, on the hill. And the central one actually overlies a, a Finavon style vitrified fort, so incredible density of archaeological remains. Um, and our excavations were just keyhole in nature, uh, but we certainly didn't find any evidence dating after um, the first century uh, AD or so. Um, so it looks like what we see on the ground is largely uh, prehistoric or Iron Age in dates, as far as we can tell. Uh, there is the cross, um, a cross slab on this hill, but it seems to be perhaps a, a boundary marker rather than um, indicating any contemporary settlement on the hill here. Um, so as I say, there's a series of, of lowland enclosures. Um, there's this uh, really quite intriguing um, enclosure at Broome now, which is to the east of Aberlemno again, um, and by the river at uh, um, South Esk here. Um, about 60 by 40 metres is intriguing um, subdivision within it. So that's, and that's one to look at uh, in the future, I think. Um, but the, the kind of lowland enclosure that really caught our attention, uh, first of all, was this one at um, Balbini. So it's just to the northeast of Aberlemno, uh, overlooking um, that routeway. And uh, before the modern village, you would have seen down to the stones uh, themselves. Um, and we were intrigued by this enclosure for a number of reasons, its position in the landscape, uh, also its size. It was kind of rhiny esque in terms of diameter, about 60, 70 metres across. Um, clearly lots of Iron Age activity going on here, There's a series of souterrains just outside the enclosure. Um, and in uh, 2018, um, we did a very small scale excavation here. And lo and behold, got early medieval dates from this enclosure, fifth to sixth centuries AD. So that was really exciting in terms of beginning to populate this landscape with sites dating to uh, the Pictish period. And again, in, into that kind of darkest of dark age period, that fifth, sixth century context, which uh, is one that's been particularly illuminated by uh, sites like Rhiney and Tappanoth in recent years. And then we were just back um, at Balbini in October or November even um, last year, we took our third year students um, to conduct a larger evaluation of the site, a strip and map evaluation uh, with uh, scheduled monument, monument consent um, and did a few more sections across the ditch here uh, and also found these large structures inside. Uh, and that to the top left is actually one of the souterrains we just caught the edge, edge of the trench. Uh, so this is our plan showing a very large oval or sub sub oval structure, a roundhouse um, uh, on on the uh, 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 west there, no east sorry, um, and a whole series of different uh, uh, deposits and, and postals and features inside. I uh, can't really say much more about this because we're waiting on radiocarbon dates. Um, it'd be interesting to see whether these structures are contemporary with the ditch and enclosure or earlier. Um, or indeed later. Um, and so clearly, you know, lots to find out about Balbini and uh, watch the space in terms of dating and more evidence uh, here. Um, so from Balbini, we um, began to cast our eyes back towards uh, the stones uh, and in particular the landscape around about the uh, church uh, at Arbor Lemno um, and the area between the roadside monuments and, and, the, and the church. Um, and so we conducted, when I say we, James uh, mainly, and uh, some of our students uh, conducted large-scale geophysics. Here's James here, in case you don't know what it looks like. Um, and then uh, this is the results of an area we surveyed um, in uh, Christmas 2020, um, just uh, on a, 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 a day we had really we, we covered this area here and uh, lo and behold, we got some really exciting results just from that last uh, uh, day before Christmas. 
uh, not realising we would go into lockdown for three, four months after that. So it was a number of months before we were able to actually uh, investigate um, these geophysical anomalies. So what we found um, just to the uh, north of the church was an area of, of some sort of settlement activity. Uh, and then to the uh, east of the church, uh, these intriguing enclosures here, which I'll, I'll zoom into now. So just highlighted in orange there. So you can see on the left here, this square or sub-rectangular enclosure. And it was very intriguing on the geophysical survey suggested a, a double palisaded enclosure and perhaps even evidence for a bank in between those two palisades. And this is it here on the right. It's about 60 by 40 meters. So around about the size of um, the Rhiney uh, palisaded enclosure. Um, but uh, square or sub uh, rectangular rather than oval in that case. Then there's a series of other um, enclosures, uh, square monuments of some kind, just to the um, west of this enclosure. And then inside um, double palisade here, we've got a, a very noticeable area of, of activity. You can see all these anomalies here. So really we set out to find out, you know, what on earth is uh, going on here at Berlamo, just to the east of the church. Uh, so our evaluation in April 2021, and uh, most recently in February, um, dug a number of trenches across uh, the double palisade enclosure, an area of, of metalworking, which is marked in green in this uh, previous plan, um, and within the centre of enclosure as well, uh, looking at this possible uh, settlement activity within the enclosure. Um, so our first trenches were targeted at the double palisade, and indeed that's what it turned out to be. Uh, two palisade lines uh, on the northern uh, uh, boundary, uh, only a metre or two metres apart, uh, full of charcoal at the base of these features. And our more recent excavation uh, on the uh, west side of the enclosure uh, showing these quite wide slots, suggesting that these are quite elaborate uh, enclosure and uh, closing works, uh, whatever they are, and evidence for a, a bank inside, as the geophysical survey suggested. So some big enclosure with timber and earth elements to this, um, enclosing, uh, as I say, an area about 60 by 40 metres. And then uh, to the north, the metalworking area, and did indeed turn out to be that, absolutely jam-packed full of slag and uh, metalworking residue, um, buckets of, of, of uh, metalworking debris coming up from these, these pits uh, here. And then we moved to the centre enclosure, or at least James and uh, my PhD student Zach did on that particular uh, day, my wife was in um, was on jury duty, so I couldn't actually make it out to to the field that day. Um, and so they put in a, a one by three meter test bit initially in the center of an enclosure, and this is what they came down with: a mirror and comb of a new Pictish symbol stone. Um, as you can imagine, great excitement at this. Um, hugs and tears. Um, phone call to me who was both elated and gutted <laughs> that I missed this. So they found this and then um, brushed away soil in the other part of the test pit and revealed more symbols. Um, and then I, I drove down to help them uncover more and uh, hopefully I didn't break too many speed limits on, on the way down. Um, and opening this trench in uh, April last year, in February this year, this is what we revealed, um, a huge paved area from a massive building or, or courtyard of, of a large building of some kind. And you can see that the Pictus, new Pictish symbol stone is actually part of the threshold, some sort of walkway um, entrance feature into this building or, or courtyard uh, here. Uh, and you can also see that it's not the only carved stone that's been incorporated into this threshold. There's cut mark stones here and here, and a spiral uh, decorated stone uh, on the south side of the building. Um, and what was 
you know, particularly exciting was obviously the symbol stone, but also the depth of deposits uh, we're dealing with. So here's a, a close up view of the symbol stone, new symbol stone, showing the, the mirror and the comb, uh, a double disc, um, a triple oval, which is actually looks like it's been overwritten by the double disc here, um, a crescent and a V rod, and also a very, very strange V rod here, a very large one that doesn't seem to go with an actual crescent. Um, and here's uh, a better image showing the, the stone prior to it being uh, lifted for uh, conservation. Uh, again, showing the symbols here, uh, the mirror and the comb, single-sided comb, uh, the triple ovals, um, the double disc and, and the crescent again at the top of the stone here. Um, and I say it's not the only carved stone, so we've got the cut marked uh, boulder here on, on what looks like almost a dressed uh, a slab here, and then the uh, spiral or double circle uh, at the actual threshold of, of the building. So this is uh, a part of, of a structure of some kind, as I say, uh, and what's noticeable is the carved stones are only in these larger slabs, um, marking presumably the entrance into this building. Uh, if that indeed what it is. And then there's another stone building just a few meters uh, to the south of the structure, which we only just uncovered this year. Um, and as I say, what's, what's particularly exciting about the deposits is that not only do we have this large building, the stone building at the uppermost level of the, of the, of the uh, um, site, we've got about half a meter of deposits underneath this building, which, uh, based on our very, very preliminary dating, which I'll come back to in a minute, stretches back into, we think, we hope, into the Pictish period. Um, and uh, this includes um, uh, floor layers, um, settlement layers, um, metalworking evidence, and also at the very base, uh, evidence for uh, timber buildings um, as well. Uh, so in the kind of mid layer, we've got this metalworking furnace um, which actually has in situ uh, smithing uh, deposits um, and marked by postals at the edge, edge of this feature. And here it is actually in section. You can see this incredibly burnt area, which is just jam packed full of oak charcoal. And then you can see the burnt, burnt clay and burnt turf here, um, which is the level where we got the smithing hearth um, actually in situ. Um, and then at the very base, um, we were only able to get a little view through this because as you, as you can imagine, moving some of these slabs was no mean feat. You can see some of the stones to the um, south of the trench there, uh, moved, moved by hand, uh, which uh, was uh, no mean feat. Um, and so we were able to get this little window into the earliest deposits. And you can see there's actually post holes dug into the, into the boulder clay there, including huge ramped post hole and a series of postals leading away from that. So perhaps an earlier um, timber building, um, more or less respecting perhaps the, the entranceway and the, the features of this latest stone building within the trench. So this is, suggests that there's been a series of different uh, structures and buildings um, and settlement layers on this site over a, over a long, long period of time. And the depth of deposits in this field is just really quite staggering. There's about uh, almost um, 80 centimetres of deposits underneath the plough soil, which for a, a low-lying site is really unusual in lowland Scotland. So again, suggests an incredible intensity of activity uh, in these fields. So in February, we um, were lucky to get some funding from Aberdeenshire Council Archaeology Service to lift the stone and Gratia uh, uh, Ainsworth um, sculpture conservation came out fantastic uh, guys um, to lift, lift the stone here. No carvings on the other side, unfortunately, but you know, can't be too greedy. Uh, and we managed to get it out the trench and off down to the conservation studio for its uh, initial um, cleanup. Oh, well, this is not properly cleaned up, but uh, this is it down in the studio. Uh, so we're hoping to launch a fundraising campaign soon to uh, get the money to conserve the stone fully and to explore options for its uh, redisplay in the future. And we're going to team up with Pictures Art Society to to raise that money. So keep your keep your eyes peeled and your your wallets poised.
So the stone itself, we've got a series of different carvings, kind of multiple lives, uh, clearly, to this monument. Um, hard to know the exact phasing, but certainly it looks like perhaps these symbols in the left are the earlier phases or fa uh, phase of carving. So this, so there's this strange um, large uh, V-rod, um, which is uh, um, uh, lying uh, uh, um, on its side rather than upright, if this was, was a standing stone. And then you've got the, the triple oval, which uh, generally appears on um, uh, uh, class one symbol stones so and in the cave sites as well. There's triple oval at Kousi, for example, just as you go into the entrance to the cave. And then the kind of more iconic and recurring symbols appear to be the, the later phase of carving. So the double disc uh, and this elaborate um, Z rod, crescent and V rod here, uh, and then a large uh, mirror and comb uh, just, just below that. So did this have multiple lives in terms of actually where it was standing or indeed not standing? Was this uh, early uh, V-rod here actually part of a building, for example? Uh, might explain why uh, the, the carving is, is uh, not quite the right way up if you're seeing it as a standing stone. And then perhaps uh, uh, life as a standing stone was a triple oval symbol initially, single, single symbol perhaps. And then um, presumably as a standing stone in its later phase with the double disc and the crescent and the mirror and comb. And then obviously reused once again in this later, later building. So what can we deduce from what we've got from uh, Aberlemno so far? Um, well, it's early days so far. The, the stone, stone itself is incredibly exciting to find. Um, a great privilege to, to uncover that. Um, so uh, James and Zach, who was there, who um, covered initially. I'm afraid it's all downhill from, from here, really. Um, so we've got uh, some initial dates back from our initial program of work back in back in April, April, and it shows that the the paved structure is 11th, 12th century in date, so relatively late in um, in the kind of post Pictish Kingdom of Alba phase, um, and that seems to um, go with um, a number of different. Uh, other elements to the site, there's uh, the metalworking pit um, seems to also date from the 11th to 12th century. So very extensive metalworking happening in that uh, early second millennium AD, which is unusual in itself. Um, and then there's clear hints of Pictish activity as well. Um, although we'll have to wait and see whether the latest batch of radiocarbon dates also support that. Uh, so, um, underneath the paving uh, from a settlement layer, we've got dates of the 7th or 8th century AD. Um, and also from the palisade, we've got a date of 7th to 8th centuries AD as well. Um, so what we're looking at potentially is evidence for a long-lived settlement extending from the Pictish period, perhaps, maybe, uh, we'll see. Uh, perhaps the palisade dating from the 7th, 8th century with settlement inside, uh, and then a later building um, of 11th, 12th century date uh, being the last phase of use uh, that we can identify archaeologically, certainly, within that field. Um, and judging by the geoph geophysical remains, there's various different stone structures within that uh, um, uh, field. So perhaps suggesting there's a major estate centre of the 11th, 12th century at Aberlemno, which may well uh, be um, uh, have its foundations on an, a major estate centre of, of the Pictish uh, period. Um, so this is uh, the same field, um, or roughly the same area that the Flemington stone came up uh, in the 1960s, um, and that combined with the radiocarbon dates certainly suggests we've got an important Pictish site of some kind in this field, but we'll obviously have to wait and see what the radiocarbon dates uh, bring. So really just uh, some acknowledgements to, to finish. Um, thanks to the Leverhulme Trust for funding the initial field work um, at uh, Aberlemno and all the, all the team that's part of that project, James O'Driscoll, uh, Edward Massa-McLean, Samantha Jones and 
Nick Evans, uh, Historic Environment Scotland is uh, funding some radiocarbonates, or they certainly are now, because I've said that, uh, well, fingers crossed they are. Um, and uh, the project's also been funded by University of Aberdeen Development Trust through charitable donations, uh, most recently by Ian and Nancy McEwen Fund, um, before that, Don and Elizabeth Cruikshank. And just like to thank uh, John Grant and family and Dale War Warburton uh, from the farm, uh, Gracia Ainsworth uh, um, crew, uh, Pictures Arts Society is going to help us with a fundraiser. Uh, Ewan Weems, who's created this fantastic video, which uh, we will be launching uh, tomorrow. Um, and to all the Northern Picts followers and uh, people who have um, helped out in the project uh, through through the years. And thanks to uh, Douglas Leningham, Hamish Fenton and HES for some of the images used in the presentation. So thank you very much for listening. And thanks once again to Anna Ritchie for inspiring uh, a generation of uh, early medieval archaeologists in, in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, as exciting as you heralded it <laughs> on social media, that was a, a super talk and so good to see, of course, what's coming out of, um, well, active exploration of landscapes, you know, in detail, which uh, we haven't seen so much of and uh, shows the benefit of having the resource to do that, which you've been so successful in getting. So well done for that. Um, right, I've just lost my chat. So um, please add your questions in. We've got one there, but I'm just going to proceed it by an observation from John, unless John, you'd like to make that observation for yourself. I can do that, Sally, thanks. Um, I'm just going to say we do have one, at least one example of an oversized crescent and V road on its side in Caithness. Yeah. It's on a standing stone. And it too is surrounded by multiple, much smaller symbols, although none of them overwrite each other in the way that uh, the new Abolimna one does. And yeah. there's a second one in Caithness, um, the name Stop. escapes me, it's fragmentary, it's been cut down and it's built into a farmhouse as a lintel crescent and V-rod, but if it were a standing stone, it would have to be well in excess of a metre wide. So mm -hmm. I think it's potentially another one of a crescent v-road on its side so it, for some reason if they wanted to write these things large but had a tall narrow stone that they were happy to put it on its side to make it big as opposed to be limited um by the width of the, the, the upright stone just yeah. a possibility yeah absolutely Thank you. Um, we've got some questions and I'm going to group some of them to you, Gordon, because I think they make better sense if they or they would just work together well. Sorry, I'll make better sense. Um, so we've got a question from Elizabeth Johnson, which is um, what kind of early medieval structure would have such large paving stones and how would they reuse or why, sorry, would they reuse a standing stone? And then Fiona Campbell Howes asked, what a fantastic, says, what a fantastic find. Would there be any charter records relating to the 11th uh, to 12th century structure? So it's about sort of understanding the context in which a structure like this would be created and what our expectations indeed might be more broadly of the state centres or whatever of this period and structures. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, as well as being an exciting find for, um, you know, six to ninth centuries, whatever we want to uh, attach to those phases below the, the stone structure. Um, you know, it's got to be a very exciting find for the 11th, 12th centuries as well in terms of, you know, major stone structures and, and buildings um, in, a, in, a, in a setting like that. So, yeah, what is it? Is it, um, it's clearly some large building and, and, uh, and courtyard setting perhaps. It looks to me like like it is a building in terms of you know that seems like a fairly obvious threshold into the interior of a building. Um, so you know really we need to do more excavation. We've we've dug a trench about five six meters away um, from the northern side of that um, uh, big trench that I showed you, um, and that that paving goes keeps on going. It goes on for at least another fifteen meters. So you're talking about, you know, a really extensive area and the paving slabs, it's hard to get a sense of that from the picture, but they're incredible. They're big glacial boulders that some of them are like half a meter thick. Um, so the resources that have gone into building that structure is, is incredible. So you are talking about, you know, 
a very wealthy uh, community um, who are putting that paving in, in, in place. The farm is called Flemington. So, you know, is there um, some uh, Flemish settlers there, perhaps uh, trying to um, tie themselves into uh, local identities through reusing the rock art and the picture symbol stone? Um, it is seems very clear that the rock art's only in that, well, as far as we know from that, that small trench, is very much focused on that threshold. So they're designed to be seen. Um, and the carving was was faced up rather than just a random reuse. So it's, you know, an intriguing um, harking back to the past, I think, in that 11th, 12th century context, when, you know, traditionally we see that as a you know major period of, of change and in incoming populations, changing kingdoms and the like. So, yeah, it's going to be really intriguing to see what turns up in that field in terms of the 11th, 12th century remains as, as well. So I should draw, I just beg the question of what's the relationship to the early church in that area? I mean, you, you indicated sites of what assumed to be various early, early medieval chapels, but of course we don't know what may have been <laughs> Abilemno itself. And I didn't quite get a sense of just how far away we are from the church. Is it like a field away or? Uh, it's a few hundred metres. I've been, been a bit vague because I don't want, you know, uh, the, the farmer to afford <laughs> to people trapping across his, his field, but uh, you, know, you know, a stone throw away from the, the church, really. Um, so, yeah, there's an intriguing <laughs> relationship there. We did find some, you know, possible boundaries, but no obvious kind of vallum around the parish church there. Um, you know, it did cross our mind, you know, are we dealing with a church itself? But I don't think so in terms of in the other trench we had a with a hearth um, and in the layers below, certainly we have, you know, metal working and, and all that from- yeah, No hint of burials from what you described either. Um, no, on, uh, on the geophysics, we've got a couple of small, smaller features, a square, square feature and a, and a round feature that could be from barrows. But again, we haven't really investigated those yet. Yeah. Okay, um, there are a series of questions then that relate to the stone. And I think, again, I might just group them. So if you've got, <laughs> well, you can see them as well. Um, so you've got Roland Spencer Jones says, the carving on the new stone at the top seems to be two planes. Reminds me of the Conan stone. How do you interpret this? Why didn't they choose a flatter stone? Um, Peter Herbert, the large V-rod seems to me to link the two effective layers of the stone. Um, so picking up on that earlier point, almost as though it originally joined originally linked to areas of carving, the quality and style of the two layers does seem to be somewhat different. So it's this kind of legend, the stone and the way the designs are overlapping it. Um, Anna, sorry, bot, I don't know who bot is. Uh, what bot is? And, oh, sorry, Anna Carmichael, sorry, asked how unusual it is for stones to be reused. And Rod says, Rod McCullough next door says, my prejudice is that reusing a symbol stone as a threshold is to to denigrate or contaminate the stone, is that necessarily so? That's maybe a separate point, but we've also got a Jen Wallace, the simple stone looked a bit irregular in the surface, not like it'd been walked over a lot and smoothed. Could that suggest it was a rarely used entrance? So we've got some questions again, kind of trying to get back to what's really happening with that stone, the carved stone and its phasings, where's it actually coming from? Why is it being reused? How are we seeing where, etc., related to it, I think. Sorry, there's a lot of yeah, questions yeah. coming in here. <laughs> well, I, I probably won't be able to answer any of those because, you know, we're still mulling over this ourselves. But yeah, no, I think there's clearly phasing. Um, they seem relatively simple symbols, which, you know, if you believe uh, myself and Martin's recent paper, you know, they could be relatively early in the, in, in the corpus. Um, and, you know, the triple oval is, mm -hmm. is, you know, does seem to be restricted to, as far as I'm aware, to... Um, uh, symbol stones rather than uh, cross slabs. Um, so yeah, all very intriguing. Um, they all seem to be carved once that kind of chunk of the top of the stone has been removed, rather than that resulting in you know different car uh, phasing phases of carving because that has happened accidentally or or whatever. And it is intriguing why they chose that side. You know the other side is actually much smoother, but you've got other examples of that in, in the pictures corpus, haven't you? Them choosing not necessarily the side you, that you would see as, as being most obvious, but perhaps, you know, David McGovern or, or some or, or the like would maybe have some insights there. Um, it could be that it's already standing. Um, I was going to ask you, yeah. that's maybe behind some of these questions here, you know, how, 
oh, have we got a stone circle or something or some yep. stone prehistoric stone setting that's being reused? Because somebody, Bill Patterson, you know, there's other huge stones of the same origin from a nearby local source. I mean, what's how Absolutely. are they getting to where? Absolutely. And yeah, you know, the rock art and those massive glacial boulders seems highly likely to me to come from a, a prehistoric monument of some kind. So, you know, are, are they dismantling a whole prehistoric cairn? Uh, just, I can't remember his name of it, but just to the south of Balbini, there's a scheduled cairn there, which is absolutely ginormous. Uh, so there does look like there was a series of, of big cairns in that landscape, which must have been really striking landscape features in the early medieval period. So, you know, are they quarrying, uh, you know, an entire monument like that? So, yeah, as Rod says, is it, you know, rather than a mark of respect, is it, you know, a mark of control and, you know, <laughs> lack of respect almost. Um, so yeah, lots of ideas to mull over and uh, yeah, we're not gonna solve it today. No. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to answer this question, but you have got a question about the battle scene on the other level. <laughs> so you can't show a yeah. picture of that and avoid that. So the, it, yeah. the, the crater, sorry if I pronounced that wrongly, says um, regarding the representation of the conflict, you refer to the scene as a military, mil major military intervention. Um, what caused you to hold back from calling it a battle? <laughs> Is, is I was just, um, I've just, uh, that's very Putin-esque. <laughs> exactly. I was tying into my inner Putin, clearly, yeah. um, which tells you horrible things about me, I think. Um, no, I, um, no, yeah, I think I got um, tripped up by Putin-esque words there. Yeah. A war um, was going on in that, uh, on that stone, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, there's still, you know, things to be said about the uh, Alex's, um, uh, location up north in terms of the in inaccessibility of, of mountain passes and the like, as, as Bede says. Um, but there's a hell of a lot going for Aberlemno as well in terms of, you know, not being too far away from uh, Dunnekin. So it could be, you know, the nearest major estate centre that they're putting up a, a monument like that to to the Battle of, of Net and Smear. Um, but, you know, equally, there are other battles between the Picts and Anglo-Saxons. Um, so yeah, lots again to mull over, and I'm not gonna, and I'm not gonna pin myself down on that. No, it's another talk, <laughs> really, isn't it? Um, otherwise, we've got uh, Hugh Levy reminding us that where various symbols actually appear um, on Triple Opal, for example, where that's actually appearing elsewhere. But I suspect Thank you. yep. you've got that on your list, or if you haven't, you can take a note of that. Um, have I missed out anybody's questions that anybody wants to really shout about? Put a comment in Q&A now if I've missed you out. <laughs> Be interesting to know Anna's observations on this, actually, given that Anna, of course, spells, spent so long thinking about um, Avalemno. Um, on yeah, absolutely. OK, well, if I if there aren't any further questions and apologies if I've missed your lovely question, um, I suspect the organisers would welcome us um, thanking Gordon for his super talk.